So welcome to another session of Present Her. And today is a special honor because uh, the guest we have, Lisa Sthalekar, is a lady of, I don't know, I mean, multiple, doesn't even begin to describe it. Uh, talents, interests, hobbies, commitments, stories. I mean, you name it. I have no idea how we're going to do this because in the time we have, there's no way we're going to do anywhere near justice. But let's make a humble effort. Lisa, welcome. Thanks very much for having me. So, you know, it's, it's always difficult when we have someone of, of the sort of multifaceted personality as you are to decide where to start. <laughs> and, uh, and therefore, uh, I'm wondering whether it might be a good idea to start as, uh, as uh, Julie Andrews says in uh, Sound of Music, at the very beginning. May not be a bad place to start. Do you, do you want me to sing as well? The Sound yeah, of Music brilliant. is one of my nice one. <laughs> <Yeah, right on. laughs> um, <laughs> let's, let's touch upon uh, the, the aspect of how destiny and how the yeah. whole sort of map of how your life has, has panned out uh, seems to have been something that was scripted by somebody sitting somewhere up in the, up in the heavens maybe. Will you share with our viewers uh, how that came to be and how you have actually dealt with it? Because different people deal with these things very differently and you yeah. dealt with it remarkably. So for, for those that, that aren't aware, I was actually adopted at three weeks of age. Um, the story pretty much goes along the lines that um, my adoptive parents, uh, who had already adopted uh, a girl from Bangalore, um, they were living in America at the time, um, and they came back to India because my father's Indian, my mother was white English, and they were looking actually to adopt a son. Uh, and they travelled around uh, Bombay, which is where my father's from, and um, went to a few orphanages. And they couldn't really seem to connect or find a child that they, they wanted to adopt. Uh, a few people suggested that they go to Pune, um, and uh, they went to my orphanage, and they were actually flying out, I think, on the Monday, and this was like a Friday. So they went there. Um, obviously, no boys again. Um, but the people there said, look, this little girl, she's actually out on loan um, because I, my understanding is, is if you've got a lot of kids within the orphanage, there's not as many staff to give them the love and care. So they kind of put them out to, to foster for a weekend or a couple of days so that they get a bit of love and attention. So I was at one of those houses and um, supposedly the, the story goes, my, my parents now um, went past, uh, had a look at me and... Uh, fell in love with me straight away and said, yep, um, we would like to take her, which kind of blows my mind. We're in 2020 and you can't just go, yep, I'll have that one. Thank you. Um, there's so much legal proceedings that take place nowadays. But um, so, yeah, I, I, I was adopted by them. Um, as I said, they were flying out on Monday to the US. So how do you get um, a passport and uh, a visa in time? And thankfully, my father's father was uh, quite well known in Bombay. Um, and there was an, an older gentleman who had always been very thankful with my grandfather and what he had done. Um, and he was waiting to repay the favour. And the favour came along that they needed the passport and the visa done pretty much within, you know, less than 12 hours. And, and it happened. So, um, so yeah, went and lived in America, Kenya, and then immigrated uh, to Australia when uh, we were four years of age. Isn't that, isn't that just remarkable that, uh, as, you, as you so eloquently describe it, everything sort of fell in place almost perfectly and and just goes to show that good deeds always come in and and repay in more measure than when one can imagine so from a from a girl uh, in in some ways the story of sunil gavaskar which is not what this program is about where they say that he was uh, placed in a in a crib uh, where his uncle noticed that the baby that was meant to be taken home by the gavaskars was different because of a uh, a small deformity on the ear 
Otherwise, Sonny might have ended up being a fisherman's boy somewhere on a, on a beach mm. in Mumbai. I don't know if you're aware of that story, but that's, nice. that's a remarkable coincidence. So yes, these things do happen. So you, you went to Michigan first with your, with your parents. You then spent some time in Kenya. And then, as you say, you moved to Australia. Now, moving to Australia and growing up there uh, mm. in what clearly is, uh, based on the li limited amount I know, a multiracial society, uh, people from different parts of the world have come yeah. together and yet the undercurrents, I don't know how, how it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, it's a lot more greater degree of awareness today. Was it hard, Lisa, for someone who was maybe not part of the majority, so to say, was it hard? Were you, did you feel differentiated in any manner uh, as you went through school and, and the early years? Well, one thing probably that differentiated my family to other, I guess, Indian families that, that came and settled in, in Australia. Firstly, my mum was white English um, and we only spoke English in the, the family mm. household. Um, we didn't have any relatives, nor did we join any Indian community when we came to Australia. So it was almost like we decided to make Australia our home and because we had no family or external family. It was like, right, how do we embed ourselves into the Australian culture? Um, and maybe that allowed us to feel like Aussies. Like if you close your eyes and you hear my accent, it's very Australian. I've got a nice distinct Australian twang. Um, so I guess from that point of view, I never felt any different. Um, and now my story is completely different to my sister's. And you think that, you know, we've, yeah. we've, we've been brought up in the same household with the same loving parents, the same opportunities. But obviously different people go through different things. So, um, so my experience personally was fine. Um, I enjoyed being outdoors. I loved playing sport. I'm in a country that um, thrives and, and admires and, and, and almost puts people on a pedestal if you're good at sport. So I was able to probably fit in a lot he, uh, you know, it was a smoother transition compared to potentially my sister um, because of the sporting aspect. Uh, so school-wise, everything like that, I felt, you know, quite comfortable. I was playing sports. I was, my weekends, my week, week nights were busy with training and playing games. Um, and sport was, was the one thing that, you know, I just, I just took to and loved playing. So that allowed me to, to fit in. It was only probably... A little bit uh, when I was older and we had family friends come over from England and they were two other Indian girls and it was my sister and the two girls and we were walking around the shops in the shops which are predominantly white Australians and I noticed a lot of people looking and then I was like why are they looking well like, we're just going shopping um, and then I looked around and I was like okay yeah we probably stand out that was probably the first time that I had noticed and then the other time was when I traveled to India in 2004 with the Australian women's side. And that was the first time I'd been back without my family. And so I'm walking down the main streets of Mumbai through the marketplace and no one's hassling me and everyone else behind me is getting hassled. I was like, oh, well, I fit into this culture pretty well. Um, I can enjoy it. So they're probably the two occasions I remember distinctly going, okay, I'm a bit different to them, you know, and them being behind me type thing. So, um, but other than that, I always gloated I had the best tan out of the, um, the team um, and, uh, and I reveled in that as, as often as I could. Absolutely. And, and, and you know, that, that sort of automatically leads me to my next question. Uh, I've been told reliably that cricket <laughs> wasn't your first choice. You, it, it sort of you tennis competed or maybe even overshadowed cricket in the early years. Tell us about how that transition happened or what made you make the choice. Yeah, you're right, tennis. So your source is absolutely right. I had tennis posters up on, on my wall of um, uh, Ivan Lendl, Stefan Edberg, um, Boris Becker, Steffi Graf. You know, Wimbledon was the title I wanted to, 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 be, to be able to, to raise. Um, yeah, tennis was my first sport and it was a sport I started to play competitively. Um, get into the representative sides, uh, rep squads. It's when I started to actually do some, you know, physical training as well, all around footwork, speed work, um, short, sharp efforts. Uh, cricket was always a sport that I enjoyed. 
So um, cricket was the social, I guess, the social aspect, the team aspect, get to hang out with my mates, even though they were all guys anyway. But um, uh, that was my fun, fun sport. And tennis was the serious sport. So probably wasn't until I was about um, probably 14, 15, maybe 15 years of age was when I made the switch. And it was simply because um, I found tennis a really lonely sport. Um, yeah, and it, and it was quite bitchy as well, like on the representative circuit, you know, your doubles partner became your enemy at singles and parents were fighting about bits and pieces. And I'm like, this is a sport that I just want to revel at. I don't want all the politics or, and I guess that was the first time for me to see our parents, administrators, the politics in sport. And it just took away the fun aspect. And one thing I noticed straight away was that I enjoyed playing in a team. And it was probably around that similar time that I got into the under 18 um, New South Wales state squad. So all of a sudden I started to see a pathway from a cricket point of view. And now you look at tennis back then even, and you look at cricket, the pathway, and there's a bit more of a clear road in cricket. And there's it's a windy path that takes a lot of hours out of your life. And I guess I chose the fun aspect. And, you know, I have no regrets with that. Um, I made that decision. I remember actually throwing a game of tennis um, at a, a representative competition. Um, and my father stormed off and said, I knew you threw the match. And I said, yeah, because I don't want to play anymore. That was my first time that I kind of came out to my parents saying, I don't want to play tennis anymore. And then from then they supported my decision and I guess it's turned out okay now. Oh, it's turned out brilliantly. I mean, it's, it's tennis is lost, arguably. But uh, <laughs> you mentioned your parents. I know that your, your parents, like most kids, parents have had a big, big role to play and, and obviously have influenced your choices to a certain extent. Uh, was your father uh, particularly instrumental in, in any manner in terms of either coaching or uh, directly involved with either tennis or cricket or both? Um, my father will say that I've learned all my cricket from him and he knows that that's an absolute lie. But he likes to, <laughs> to, to, to boast now. Um, my father, obviously Indian-born, um, loved cricket, you know, went to CCI to watch the Indian team when he was a young boy and so had always had a passion for the game. And he certainly passed that on to me because... I guess I was daddy's little girl and I wanted to be like him. Um, so he exposed me to the game. We went to the SCG when I was young and, you know, it was all great. Um, and obviously I spent a bit of time in the backyard playing with him. But he was certainly aware of the fact that from a sporting point of view, he didn't have the skills to be able to help me out. So I was very fortunate from a young age, tennis and cricket, that I was able to get private coaching straight away. And I think that allowed my... my my sports whatever I chose to accelerate um, but yeah certainly he he uh, he started the the fire in my belly to to want to play the game so I do owe him a, a lot of a lot of credit to that and then I have to also thank my mother who literally um, when I was uh, growing up in school would pick me up from school feed me a meal then would go off to training drive me the taxi driver literally um, and, and my chef, my personal chef. There were times that I, I still remember like year 11 ringing up at lunchtime going, mum, I'm really hungry. I reckon I'll need a quiche or something when I get home. And lo and behold, there'd be a quiche when I got home. So, you know, the, they, they were two people that were very dedicated to uh, helping me out. And then my sister um, was a number one supporter, even though she, she may have felt fallen asleep a lot at cricket. Um, she always came, which was very good, right to the end. <laughs> Absolutely. That, that, that's very interesting. Isn't it remarkable, uh, Lisa, that in, in so many great sporting careers and even in life otherwise, the people who often stand behind and make it possible yeah. uh, don't often get spoken about, don't often get the credit. Not that they're craving for it. I think their offspring or their, their sons or daughters or uncles, whoever they are, their success is what they, they take joy and pleasure in. Uh, I want to digress for a second and touch upon another area which is obviously becoming a very important part of sport and life in general, which is how to cope with, with personal tragedy or personal challenge and particularly when from a mental health perspective, 
you get into an, a space which is not entirely comfortable. Uh, yeah. It is something that is fortunately, I think, being spoken about a little more today than it used to be back in the day. And yeah. we know from what we've read and heard that uh, after the unfortunate passing away of your mother, you had a similar challenge. For the benefit of the younger people in particular mm. watching this, would you care to just walk us through how you cope with it and what your advice to anyone who would be in that kind of position? Because today's world of COVID is not helping this situation. So no. very, very appreciated if you could please uh, shed, shed some. Yeah. Look, I, I think um, obviously my mother passed away when I was 21, 22. Right? And it's, that's a long time. We're coming up to 18, 19 years now. Um, but yeah, obviously, uh, my mother was the glue to our, our family and did everything for us. So you kind of take that glue away and we kind of all of us fell apart in our own unique circumstances. Well, one thing that I was fortunate about is um, the hospital that she, she passed away in, they provided um, uh, grief counselling. And so what I did was, you know, for six months, I formed a really good relationship with my grief counsellor. And she almost became, because especially I think with a mother um, and a daughter, or maybe even with a son, that you go and you share your day-to-day -day activities and what's been going on, what your friends are doing, all of that type of stuff. So I lost that person. So my grief counsellor, you know, which is great, they got paid basically to listen to me. And it was my chance to kind of get everything that was off my chest. Um, you know, I, I, I wrote a, a diary and I still actually have it of, you know, after mum passed away, how I coped, what I was thinking, what I was feeling. Um, and I find, and hence probably why I went down the track of psychology as well, found it very interesting, the, the roller coaster of emotions that happen um, when you're, you're dealing with grief. Um, you know, and what I also used as, as probably a way to escape was my cricket. Um, I think I learned early on that once you turn up to cricket, you put aside whatever's happening. Now I had obviously some wonderful teammates um, and some teammates actually who had already lost one of their parents. So there was a kind of network there already around me that were obviously were very understanding, very forgiving, um, willing to help out. Um, I think it's important firstly to get the help that you need. And sometimes you think you may not need help, but you probably just need to talk. Um, so I, I'm a big believer in, in talking about your feelings, sharing with people that are close to you, how you're going. And it's okay if it's, if things are tough and you're having a really dark day. And um, I, call, I used to call it the clouds are kind of coming over me. You know, I, I used to get really foggy. I couldn't, I couldn't make decisions. I didn't know what I wanted to eat. I didn't know what I wanted to watch. I just wanted to sleep. You know, you've got to kind of pick up on all of those um, telltale signs. Um, and people around you need to be able to express their concern as well. So we were fortunate for, for my whole family that we had that support. But the only thing that takes, that will heal you is time. And, and do you ever really get over it? I don't think you do. You just learn to adapt and, and deal with it um, and move on. So, um, yeah, I think it's important that initially you get the help that you need. And then um, I, I kind of went through a couple of relapses as well. A few probably, so she passed away in 2002 and uh, 2009, I went through a really dark, phase as well um, and that was kind of highlighted around cricket as well it was um, physiological burnout um, mental fatigue and then the, the depression kind of came back as well so um, again it was trying I tried to battle my way through it it wasn't until my father said you need to get some help you need to probably be on antidepressants um, and I think also there's a stigma about um, well you, sh you should be able to cope you know, chin up, off you go, get on with it. Um, or have a, have a, here in Australia, we say have a cup of concrete and harden up. Um, so there, there are all of those sayings, um, and I'm sure that there'd be heaps from a cultural point of view over in India as well, where you just need to get on with it. But sometimes you can't. You actually physically can't. And um, mm. that's when you need the help and support of the people around you. And, and I'm glad to say that cricket and, and other aspects of, um, of the sporting field and even from a corporate point of view, um, mental health is um, spoken about a lot more positively that, yep, everyone's going through it. And I think we've seen in this COVID-19 being in lockdown, 
not being able to socialise, travel, do your normal routines, daily activities has really affected people's mental health. So it is a big concern and um, something that I'm certainly comfortable to talk about and share my experiences, but certainly I'm a good listener as well if anyone needs uh, an ear. Thank you. I mean, that, that is really remarkable and just goes to show uh, the kind of person you are, Lisa, because it's not often that you see people who are in the public eye, who, who are public pers personas in many ways, willing to say what you said and most importantly, willing to offer what you just did. So thank you so much for that.